I feel like using Paul's technique and asking what different disciplines people are from so I know what I can play fast and loose with today. Um, how many people know what the hard problem of consciousness is? Who has never heard of the hard problem of consciousness? Oh, that's good. OK, good. Um, that, that's helpful to me. So um, the, uh, the title of the talk and, uh, is uh, Why the Hard Problem of Consciousness is Not So Hard. In the early 90s, uh, I think it was about 1994, uh, there started to be some conferences held at uh, Tucson called Towards the Scientific uh, Study of Consciousness. Some of us had been there. And I was at the very first uh, one. And uh, in fact, I was one of the first three speakers. But either the second or the third speaker, or maybe he was the first, was a philosopher named David Chalmers. And David Chalmers uh, uh, is now a, a force inside philosophy. And he's been telling philosophers for a long time that there is this very hard problem, although he's not the first. It's, it's really the, the hard problem, as you'll see, is kind of the, the modern way of speaking about the mind-body problem. So today in an hour, I'm going to tell you that the mind-body problem is nothing that you should worry too much about or fuss about, uh, and uh, I'll try to explain why. Um, so, um, so part of what I'm trying to react to in this talk is sort of People who are overly impressed and want to pull their hair out about the problem of, oh my gosh, how is it possible that we are conscious, that we have experiences, that there is something it is like to be uh, you or me or anyone else. Now, some of the rhetorical titles, alternative rhetorical titles I have for my uh, talk today uh, go like this. Is the solution to the heart problem one that philosophers are supposed to deliver as opposed to, say, other people? And I actually think it's not a philosophical problem. It's not an interesting philosophical problem. It's a problem that uh, scientists are to deliver, and scientists are already in the uh, uh, process of delivering the answer. And uh, as you'll see, it's not so hard. By the way, it isn't easy either. The title of my talk doesn't say the hard problem of consciousness is easy. It just says it's not so hard. Don't get caught up in all the um, uh, myster uh, mystery. Is the solution to the hard problem that ordinary people are supposed to find satisfying? My answer to that is no, also. I'm struck by the fact that um, uh, Dan reminded me, just because Dan's from Harvard, about a dinner party I went to about seven or eight years ago. And uh, there were two people from his university, one an economist and one a physicist. And as soon as we started talking during the cocktail part of the dinner about what we did, did both of them sort of at once said to me, oh my gosh, you work on consciousness. No one has a clue as to how consciousness works. And I thought to myself, it would be very rude if I said to a physicist, no one has a clue about how <laughs> physics works, or if I thought, that I'm supposed to be uh, in a position to like know how physics works. Uh, and the same thing for economists, uh, although I like the work that we're now seeing in neuroeconomics. But again, it would be odd for me to think that I'm in a position that where I should know about the principles of micro or macroeconomics. These are areas for experts to work on, as it were. But I think people often treat the problem of consciousness as one that you're supposed to satisfy me, the ordinary person, about the nature of consciousness. And of course, this is, an, uh, those of you who are philosophers in the room, I asked this question. This is the third rhetorical. How, how smart or useful is it for young, intelligent young philosophers and some aging ones uh, to work on the hard problem of consciousness, where basically that just involves writing articles telling us what a hard problem consciousness <laughs> is? And my answer to that is it doesn't maximize anyone's utility. It's not even satisficing. Um, it's, certainly, <laughs> it's certainly not optimistic. And the general point of view that I'll be trying to uh, sort of suggest to you, you should think, is that physicalism en is enough. Where by physicalism, I'll spell out what I mean. Now, so today's aim is uh, back in 1992 when I wrote my first and only book on consciousness, um, uh, I uh, named some people, uh, some philosophers who are still up and about, Mysterians. And Mysterians are people who do try to convince you that we'll never understand the nature of consciousness. And I distinguish Mysterian types into old Mysterians and new Mysterians, but they've been very effective in making people like economists and physicists from, from good schools <laughs> think that no one understands anything about the nature of consciousness. So today, even if you don't know yet that you have Mysterian tendencies, trust me, you do. And I'm going to try to help you and do some therapy so that you don't, aren't taken by them. OK. Now, what do we philosophers do? What do we get paid for? Well, it's a little bit embarrassing after coming from people who, <laughs> uh, who do actual experiments and have labs and postdocs and all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, but uh, one, one job description of philosophers is this one that I love from a philosopher named Wilfred Sellers. Um, because it describes what we philosophers do when we do wonder or worry about such things as the mind-body problem. So Sellers says this, the aim of philosophy, abstractly formulated, is to understand how things in the broadest possible sense hang together in the broadest possible sense. 
So what might that mean? Well, one of the things that Sellers thought, and I think this is still something that I, my entire career has been interested in this, uh, these two things. There are ways of thinking that are scientific. Sellers called those the scientific image of image, okay? And there are ways of thinking that are not scientific. And you might just wonder, how do they come together? So for example, a famous um, uh, 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 passage in Sir Arthur Eddington's, I think it was called The Structure of the Physical World. But anyway, 1922 book by Arthur Eddington. Uh, he says this, he says, I walk into my study today, he says this philosopher's study, referring to himself in that old fashioned way that physicists used to, and he said, I look at my desk, my, or my philosopher's desk, and all of a sudden I see two desks. One is the desk of ordinary common sense, the desk that is a homogeneous object, or possibly it's, a, it's the desk of atomistic common sense, where it's crunched together atoms all together. And Eddington says, but now I see a second desk. It's the desk that I am part of the discovery of, which is a desk that's mostly empty space. And he asks himself, he said, in fact, there are two of everything in the room. There's two of my pen, two of my chair, and two desks. And he asks himself this question, can I bring together these two ways of thinking about this thing uh, at once? And um, you might think of it, there's various possibilities how you might think about it, right? You might think of it as a kind of gestalt image where you switch back and forth like a Necker cube kind of thing. You see it once under the description from elementary particle physics, and then other times you see it the other way. They're not contradictory, it doesn't look like, but uh, you might worry if they are contradictory. Now, one of the things that affects us in modern times, uh, in different places in the world, in different ways, are these conflicts between what Sellers called the manifest image, that's the ordinary way of thinking about the desk, and the scientific image of desks, and uh, the scientific image. Now, it comes up also, if you think about humanistic images, the way people conceive of themselves. And we know this is where philosophers have often had to do kind of therapy, because it is true, like so American higher education and lower education actually, uh, gets worried, gets fussy about Darwin's theory because people say that messes with the way we think about ourselves. And I think uh, one ought to admit it does actually, okay? So these are kind of cultural conflicts where maybe the philosopher can sort of do some work to say you don't need to be as worried as you think, maybe you can do, well, you get the idea. Um, okay, so uh, here are two examples of clashes uh, uh, that are going on right now thanks to developments of the mind sciences or the Geisteswissenschaften. Another way to think about this actually is Max Weber at the end of the 19th century wrote about the fact that the development of the Geisteswissenschaften, the spirit sciences, was disenchanting the world, was undermining, taking away the magic and the mystery of it all. And some ways in which this allegedly happens is uh, free will, uh, the problem of free will. Uh, and one might say, well, the more and more we get at the sort of causal structure of reality, the less and less chance there is for something like uh, what we philosophers call a libertarian conception of free will. The idea that I'm somehow the prime mover myself unmoved. And I think this is a, uh, an area in which, well I have a lot to say, actually I say that usually. If I was the benevolent dictator of philosophy, I would not allow any discussion of free will for a hundred years and see if things worked out okay. I think they would. <laughs> it's a black hole where you know great minds go in and no light ever comes out um, kind of thing. But another area where people, some people think there's a problem is in the area of experience or consciousness or you hear words bandied about like qualia or phenomenal experience. By the way, uh, would you, Chris, would you tell me like when 45 minutes are up so I can wrap up so there's plenty of time for discussion because we got a lot of people here. Okay. So what, do you, what should you do when the two images clash? When in our case, for example, say neuroscience conflicts with a certain image people have of themselves. Well, one idea was, would be to say, uh, don't worry much about it. It's like the Eddington case. Science just delivers the needle point of detail to things. So if you think you have free will, then just think when, when neuroeconomists tell us about how we deliberate and choose, what they're doing is telling you about the structure of free will or deliberation or choice. That's one way to do it. Another thing, though, I might say, sometimes the situations aren't like the Eddington cases. They're actually where there's a clash. So on a classical humanistic view, what some people call the great chain of being view, right? There's pure spirit at the top of things, God. At the bottom, there's dirt. And uh, moving on up, plants, part of nature, uh, 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 pure res extens extensa, extended stuff. Below God, angels. And then in the middle, humans who partake of the spiritual world and of the um, uh, material world, uniquely. Okay? On that view, 
uh, then there's conflicts between scientific views of people, say the Darwinian view, and a certain um, view. What do you do then? One attitude would be that science trumps. Another view would be, no, the humanistic image trumps. Um, so um, I was at a conference recently, a summit conference of a bunch of us uh, uh, naturalists like myself up in Stockbridge. You can look at these on the, uh, their, their, our meetings are online. And there Dan Dennett said, well, there really isn't free will, but we shouldn't tell everyone that. Um, <laughs> so there's like this kind of discussion takes place among us when we get in our little cabals, okay? So that would be <laughs> science trumps, but don't tell everybody that because it had bad social effects. Um, okay, you get the idea. So here's the hard problem for those of you, the, the uh, one half of the audience who never heard about this specific version of it. It goes like this. It just, you could read through, well, I'll read part of it. It's undeniable that some organisms are subject of experience. But the question of how it is that these sy systems are subjects of experience is perplexing. Why is it that when our cognitive systems engage in visual and auditory information processing, we have visual or auditory experience? the quality of deep blue, the sensation of middle C. How can we explain why there is something it is like to entertain a mental image or to experience an emotion? It is widely agreed that experience arises from a physical basis, but we have no good explanation of why and how it so arises. That's, that's kind of an expression of the hard problem and a certain kind of conclusion that reinforces the um, abject ignorance uh, of, the, of us. Okay. Why should physical processing give rise to a rich inner life at all? You can imagine that said rhetorically or asked non-rhetorically. You could just say, Why, how is it? How is it that it happens? You know, you might, like you might ask, you might say, how does water freeze? Someone says, ah, the mean molecular kinetic energy slows down so much that that's what it does. Or why does it uh, boil? You say, the mean molecular kinetic energy gets up around whatever and then it steams. And then you tell the mechanism, okay? So you might be wondering about that. Or you might be saying, no one could ever understand it, okay? And that's the worry that I have about this way. So, but here's, a, here's some ways of putting the hard problem. Uh, how is consciousness possible in the material world? How does two and a half pounds of fatty tissue in here with a bunch of neurons doing their thing and some neurochemistry, how does that ever give the technicolor of experience? How is it possible that this uh, works this way. How does subjective experience arise or emerge from brain tissue? How does subjectivity arise from objective physical states of affairs? So these are just ways of, the way I'm trying to state them first pass, these are perfectly reasonable ways of stating certain kinds of questions. Now what happens though is in philosophy at least and among certain other people, you get a certain tone of voice that then comes in and I say so this is the sort of rhetorical hard question you need to say it in a maximally mystery, mystery mongering voice. How is it possible? <laughs> How is it possible? You get the idea, okay? And then you're supposed to sort of go home at night and say to your family and your friends, no one has a clue about how it's possible. <laughs> okay. Now, the first thing to say, well, this is what, this might be useful to, there's a lot of different ways. So, so I, I really do think the hard problem is just the modern version uh, of the uh, mind-body problem. And it comes to us in the form that is made particularly salient by uh, the, the neurosciences. Uh, because we now do think, uh, unlike say Descartes, that the brain isn't just the vehicle through which the mind speaks. So those of you who, uh, so, so here are some taxonomy of responses to the hard problem. There's dualist responses. So most familiarly, actually in 1949, Gilbert Ryle in a book called The Concept of Mind uh, said this. He said, the myth of the ghost in the machine is still the dominant view among most laypersons, scientists, and philosophers in Britain. 1949. Um, so now that's interesting. Let's just suppose he's right, okay? What is the myth of the ghost in the machine? It's the Cartesian idea that I have this body but closely united with it, as Descartes would say, is my mind. And my mind is non-physical, and it somehow or other does amazing things, like my mind, because I now choose to make a pedagogical point by walking, is able, as a non-physical substance, to move 185 pounds of fighting manhood. <laughs> That's kind of amazing, okay? But these are the powers that, on the Cartesian view, minds must have over bodies. Now you can see right away why this is going to be an unstable view because it looks like you're going to violate conservation laws and all that kind of stuff. Okay, but that's one view. 
Another view, there's, there's various kinds of dualism. I could talk about them in the question period. Another kind of dualism is called property dualism. This is a popular view right now. It doesn't say that the mind is a physical substance right next to my body, but there's some more peculiar relation between my brain and my thoughts. My thoughts are non-physical and so on. A popular view uh, is called epiphenomenalism. Now, epiphenomenalism is the view, William James, those of you who uh, read his Principles of Psychology, uh, 1890, uh, uh, James uh, quotes Huxley, Huxley, uh, Thomas Huxley, who was Darwin's bulldog, as um, uh, saying this. He says, the c consciousness stands to the mind as the toot of a choo-choo train stands to what drives the train. Okay, so you picture the big train coming through town, the, the fire in the belly is what's causing the train to go, but you see some steam being let off and you see a little bit of noise, and that's what consciousness is. It's just a little bit of noise coming off the system. Or think of it as, um, you might think when you're cooking eggs on oil, okay, you might be a child and you might think, oh, it's the sound that's cooking the eggs. But of course you'd be wrong. The sound has nothing to do with it. The sound is just an epiphenomenon of the cold egg meeting the hot oil and it's a side effect. It, it's physical, but it's not doing much of anything interesting. Okay? And James in 1890 says, epiphenomenalism is an unwarrantable impertinence in the current state of psychology. Now, I personally think it still is, actually. Okay? We shouldn't say that the consciousness does no causal work. That would be unbelievably peculiar. It would mess up, actually, neuroeconomics as well as a lot of other things, I think, if we thought that our subjective states did no work so whatsoever. But I'm interested. Every year I speak in the, um, the uh, cognitive neuroscience group at Duke uh, to the introductory PhD students. And often, in fact, every year I have the same conversation with the teacher who's in charge of it, who's a great neuroscientist. He says, so if you think that consciousness is physical, that conscious mental states are physical, you think they're epiphenomenal. I say, no, 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 no. But this is a kind of a, we could maybe come back to that, but there's, this view is out there. Then there are limitivist people. These are sort of like modern day behaviorists maybe. They just say, and some people accuse Dan Dennett of having this view, consciousness is an illusion, don't even talk about it, get over it. Then there are people like what I call principled agnostics, uh, Thomas Nagel, at least used to be one of these. These are people who say, I don't know what the answer to the mind-body problem is. It's just a very difficult problem, and I'm kind of maintaining neutrality on it. The two, then there's the, the view that I like. These two are underlined. Well, the view that I like is underlined, and the other view that I don't like is underlined too. So <laughs> what I, the position that I defended back in the 90s, actually maybe in 89 even, in some papers I wrote before, was what I call constructive naturalists. Assume that physicalism is true. I'll explain why you should assume it uh, as an inference to the best explanation. And be quiet about the mind-body problem and let the scientists now do the work of explaining to us how the mind-brain world work in concert. And that will be, at the end of the day, the story about how consciousness works in us. Uh, actually, how consciousness and unconsciousness, not the consciousness as an entity. Mysterians, however, say some things like this. The mind is either physical and will never understand it, or the mind is not physical and will never understand it. That is, with any extant metaphysics, you'll never understand it. Sometimes people um, have said, f good philosophers, um, uh, who are just, uh, will say things like, it would be like if a chimpanzee was smart enough to ask some questions about quantum physics, but they wouldn't be smart enough to answer them. That's sort of thought to be the predicament that we're in. We can ask questions about consciousness, but we can't answer it. And there are actually a bunch of nowadays what are called panpsychists around. They were always around, but some people like Tononi is a panpsychist. Christoph Koch sometimes is a panpsychist. They think that it's so complicated to explain how from the Big Bang there could have been consciousness emerging that we should just assume that consciousness is a fundamental force in nature. Chalmers sometimes has a similar view, that even like little particles have are sentient in some sense. I won't discuss this, but I can send you to. <laughs> okay, now the first thing to notice is that if, if there is a hard problem of consciousness, it's like a lot of other hard problems, okay? It isn't like unique in being like the only hard problem around. So here are some uh, famous problems. Uh, and there's, these are all perplexing. These are not easy problems, they're all perplexing. So what Leibniz I said was the fundamental philosophical problem. Remember, Aristotle said all philosophy begins in wonder. Kids are good at wondering, right? Uh, Heidegger loved this first problem. 
why is there something rather than nothing? Why is there anything at all? And of course we know there's some stories. Someone says, oh, I know. The reason there's something now here on April 9th, are we not, the 9th? The reason there's, people, there's things going on right now, April 9th, 2013 here, is because 14 billion years ago there was the singularity that banged. So, oh, thank you very much. Now I'll go rest. <laughs> um, and of course we know there are theological and naturalistic ways of talking about what if anything when you get the idea. There's also this question. We do know if we accept something like the Big Bang story, and there are other stories, that when the singularity did bang 14 um, billion years ago, uh, it could have been completely explained by physics and inorganic chemistry. Those are the only sciences that say an omniscient being would have needed to explain them. But then at some point there came to be life, and then you needed organic chemistry and biology. That's interesting. How did the physical and inorganic, how did just bosons and fermions eventually yield living things? That's a complicated question. So that's the origin of life question. We also know that if, assuming as the standard story goes, that something about 4.5 billion years ago, there were unicellular organisms. And if you think like I think, they were not sentient. That is, there was nothing it is like, to use Tom Nagel's phrase, there was nothing it was like to be those first unicellular organisms. If you think that, you have a problem, though, explaining how it was the case that once there were, say, dinosaurs 65 million years ago, there was something it was like to be a dinosaur. So consciousness looks to have come into being. Life looks like it came into being. Conscious life looks like it came into being, and so on and so forth. And who knows what is next? I don't know. I'm not going to be right to see it. OK. Um, other deep philosophical problems are this question. I think Dan Schachter was uh, raising it in some way, not about consciousness so much, but about the things we do with our minds. What adaptive functions do things play? Now, usually we think that if any, if there's a universal phenotypic trait, the usual assumption is it's an adaptation. OK? Uh, and it feels to me as if my consciousness, at least my awake consciousness, does stuff for me, uh, gets me, gets me through the day, as we say. I'm not so sure, and I've written about this, about dream consciousness. I think that's just a, probably more likely a spandrel. But it'd be interesting to give an account of why consciousness evolved, what its function is. Okay, so these are difficult problems, but I think by and large these are also, we think, uh, largely scientific problems that have to be solved, if they can be solved within a broadly scientific worldview. And maybe they can't be solved. Uh, so here's an old uh, cartoon. Um, and I, I like to sometimes with my undergraduates give this cartoon because I think, I ask them to think about this. So you have the, if the professor writing the equations on the board gets to the point then the miracle occurs, it matters a lot whether or not He's writing that on the board in my divinity school or my neuroscience department. If it's in my divinity school, they say, cool, then the miracle occurred. <laughs> if it's in the neuroscience department, that's the, uh, that's the PhD student's dissertation, figuring out what the miracle is. <laughs> okay? That's exactly what the elders in the room, Wolfgang and Paul and Dan, they say, now you go work on that, right? And they, <laughs> and they go home at 6 o'clock. OK, um, now, uh, part of the reason, so uh, the, the hard problem, so one of my teachers was a great philosopher, Willard Van Orman Quine, and uh, we used to say when I was in graduate school about certain kinds of metaphysical thinking in philosophy that it was like playing tennis without a net. That is, that we meant by that basically what you, you would think. It, the, what, what are the rules of this game where people sit around and do thought experiments about how the mind is a non-physical substance? This was the worry. And Quine had an idea. Now, this is just being honest about my own methodology. Quine thought that if you're going to do something like philosophy of mind, worry about the mind-body problem, you better make sure that what you're doing is continuous with the best science. That's the way philosophers should operate. It's not, there's not an autonomous discipline of philosophy. You need to be hooking up with and paying attention to, like I was, had the luxury of doing today, my colleagues who do actual scientific work and trying to think through how this has implications, if it does, for standard philosophical problems about, for example, agency or consciousness and so on. OK, so now here's the trouble with uh, uh, the current um, spate of people who are uh, now, who are mysterians, 
they play according to what I've been calling Australian rules philosophy. <laughs> now it is, again, it's like tennis without a net and most of these people are, at, um, are Australian but not all. In fact, uh, one of them, the, the person who led this off is a great American philosopher now deceased, David Lewis. But, but so David Chalmers, who's the leader of this group um, of uh, current Mysterians, um, they pretty much only use thought experiments to show that the hard problem is insoluble, Gedanken experiments, not science. They're not trying to do what's continuous with the best science. They're using thought experiments. And the assumptions of their thought experiments involve unbelievable complicated philosophical assumptions. So for example, modal logical rationalism. Modal logic is the logic that was only really invented uh, formally in the 60s, I think, but has to do with necessity and possibility, the logic of those kind of terms, necessity and possibility. Nego Frege and 2D semantics, you don't need to know what that is. It's a little of Frege with a dose of Hilary Putnam and Saul Kripke thrown in. It's complicated and it's controversial. And it also involves what, well these three things are what Dave Chalmers calls the golden triangle of assumptions. And the third one is a priori entailment. Well without knowing what this means exactly, um, I can just say those of you who know that philosophers historically divided up into rationalists and empiricists and rationalists like a priori entailments because you can do those in your armchair. <laughs> a posteriori entailments, you have to go out and look around in the world. So this is a fundamental, I think, difference in attitude. But for example, the, the thought experiments go back a very long time. So one of Descartes' most famous thought experiments is this. I can conceive of myself without a body. Can you conceive of yourself without a body? Well, try. This is in Descartes' first meditation. This is his first argument for mind-body dualism. I can conceive myself without a body, but I cannot conceive of myself without a mind. Therefore, mind is essential to what I am, body is not. It's a classical argument from Descartes, okay? Now notice how these current arguments work. Oh, well, this one. Frank Jackson is famous for Mary the Colorblind Scientist. He's Australian, see? I'm not, it's not <laughs> ethnic, uh, um, okay. But uh, this, th you may know this story. He says, oh my gosh, if physicalism is true, then imagine a, a scientist who grows up in a black and white room. She knows everything there is to know about color, about the physiology of color, the way color works in the world, the reflectance properties of surfaces and how they produce color perceptions. But then she gets out of her black and white world and she sees her first uh, red tomato. And the question is, well, didn't Mary have a new experience? And everybody says, yes, yeah, she did have a new experience. He says, so therefore physicalism is false. All the physical facts don't a priori entail what it's like to experience red. It's a terrible argument. No one thinks it's any good. But, and there are volume upon volume upon volume. Even Frank Jackson, who put it out, doesn't think it's any good uh, about the many ways in which it has gone wrong. But um, it leads many people to think that physicalism is false. Now, David Lewis, as I mentioned, he uh, is the American who spent a lot of time in Australia. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, this just tells you the method. The philosophers in the room would be picking up on this. But uh, Lewis, this is a quote uh, from something David Lewis wrote. She calls minimal physicalism. Physicalism is true for any world W, if and only if, now notice we're talking about worlds that not, if and only if a complete physical duplicate of world W is also a complete duplicate in every other respect. That is, if we set about only duplicating the world W according to its physical properties and relations, then as a consequence we have duplicated W in every respect. This thesis is stated in shorter terms by saying that all properties are either physical properties or supervene on physical properties. So if you're a physicalist, you would believe this. But then what happens is uh, in David Chalmers' work, and David Chalmers gives several arguments for Mysterianism. Uh, he loves Frank Jackson's argument about Mary. Um, but he, here's an also an argument of him. Imagine a complete physical duplicate of yourself in an other world. By the way, this world doesn't have to be Mars. It could be like an other universe. Okay, imagine a complete physical duplicate of yourself in another world. Could you conceive of that duplicate of yourself being just like you in every physical way, but absent consciousness, like nobody's home? It passes the Turing test, as we say. It acts just like you, but there's nobody home. You with me? There's no experiences. There's no qualitative states. Chalmers says, if you're smart enough <laughs> and you play by Australian rules, you should be able to ex conceive of that. Second premise, if you can conceive of that, g given that whatever is, con I'm sorry, second premise, whatever is conceivable is possible, therefore zombies are possible, and Chalmers actually concludes from this, he thinks it's demonstrative that physicalism is false, 
Joe Levine, another good, Joe Levine was the first one out of the gate with this kind of argument. He doesn't think it's false. It's probably false. He's come to now believe. Joe Levine was the person who th talked about the explanatory gap between neural talk and mental talk. But the trouble is there's a huge amount of controversy. A lot of smart people say, no, I, if I conceive of myself in another world duplicated, it has consciousness. There is somebody home. This is the trouble with thought experiments, you see? What are the rules? What are the rules? Some people can conceive it and some people can't. In fact, there was a survey done in a field called experimental philosophy. Most philosophers claim they can't conceive it. Well, if you're playing according to these rules, then it looks like it's kind of like surveying people for what their intuitions are. In any case, this is the kind of the Gedanken experiment that's going on now um, that causes. Um, now, first thing to notice is that even if, okay, so first two things to notice. The argument, even if you were accepted, doesn't show that physicalism is false in this world. This is a very important point. One way to do metaphysics, thinking about, the, back to Seller's point, the idea that you're trying to figure out how things hang together. Well, one way to do metaphysics is to say, and most people I think who've thought about consciousness think this way, I'm interested in how consciousness is realized in sentient beings on Earth. Next I'll get to like what they might have to be like in Mars or Alpha Centauri, okay? I'm not talking about any possible world. Other universes, I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about on Earth. So this claim is that physicalism is false, even if it's, uh, uh, at best it would show that there's some possible world in which mental states are realized non-physically. Now I don't even think it can be used to show that because I question the whole methodology. But what should we think if we were gonna ask philosophical questions in a Quinean spirit, how is consciousness realized on Earth? Think about it. Now, I, you c I'll come back to this in a second. Here are some things to say in response to Mysterians, and then I'll, I'll, I'll move from the fourth one to give a more substantial answer to the Mysterian. One thing you might say, and some psychologists say this, so for example, Paul Bloom, a good psychologist at Yale, thinks that people are nat kids are natural born dualists. I don't agree with him about this, but it's an interesting idea. Um, namely, he thinks that it's just natural that young children um, think of uh, mental life as non-physical in a certain way and that they think of the wor physical world as different. This just shows that it's a sort of a heuristic that's built in. So we're biased to think in the direction of dualism even though dualism is false, Bloom would think. One way to think about this that I've often, I've looked back on all the great philosophers uh, historically and as far as I can tell, and I work a lot in comparative philosophy, Every great world tradition has been dualistic or something close to it. Every great world tradition. I work in Chinese philosophy, so I'm in Indian philosophy. They're almost always that way. Um, it's hard to find philosophers who, f when they introspect their thoughts at least, who feel their neural granularity. But that's not that surprising because it would be weird if Mother Nature put us in touch with that stuff, right? It would just be a terrible design if she were to put us in touch with that. But, um, so some people think uh, the first part, that there's sort of innate cognitive biases, we're not in touch with this. The other idea might be that there's social biases too that make it hard to see how we should think as physicalists. What, what would these be? Well, you might just say uh, dualism has been a very powerful belief in our cultures. It's tied in with other ways of thinking about things. So for example, almost every culture ever studied thinks that once you die, you can go on. There's survival. Well, we know bodies die, decay, and disperse, so the part of you that goes on better not be something physical. And this is, again, another uh, way. So these are called karmic eschatologies. You see them in rebirth or reincarnation or Abrahamic traditions. And dualism goes well with that. The other thing that I said at the very beginning about um, uh, the, thinking that the idea Thinking that the explanation of consciousness in physical terms should be satisfying. This is what I meant at the very beginning about thinking that ordinary people should say, oh, thank you very much, I get it now. We don't think that about quantum physics and we shouldn't think that about uh, mind science. And a lot of the mysterians say things like, but I just don't get it. How could the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat? How could my love, how could my joy just be, and then you'd Someone says oxytocin level fluctuations, neural firings, and that sort of thing. I mean, but that's asking science to do something it's not required to deliver. Science is required to g deliver satisfactory explanations, not intuitively satisfying explanations. 
Okay. Uh, and now the fourth one is a picture view of the mind, which seems to me to be obvious and commonsensical, and this is what I'll now turn to. It's called subjective realism. Uh, so I ask the question, is physicalism enough? Now, and I say yes. Um, uh, it's the best way to think about things uh, by far right now than all the other alternatives. And why think physicalism could be true? Well, you just put together these two ideas. Look at, if you take as a citizen of the modern world Darwin seriously, then you think you're an animal. And if you think you're an animal, you shouldn't think you have any special immaterial parts. And then there's, that's a brain in case you're wondering. And so the neo-Darwinian theory of evolution plus modern neuroscience should just make you assume that the place where the action's occurring is in this embodied being in the world. Um, so what is physicalism? Okay, so here's, here's uh, what I'm gonna, by the way, these terms, I'm not fussing about terms like physicalism versus materialism versus naturalism. I usually call myself a naturalist for reasons that I could go into in the question period. But I'm going to define what I mean by physicalism right here. First pass, at the level of consciousness, the physicalist, as I'm defining him, just says this, consciousness is an entirely psychobiological process. Whatever consciousness is, it's entirely a psychobiological process. Um, or, put another way, that's a little bit more narrow, all mental events or mental states, both conscious and unconscious, by the way, that's another thing about the, all the fussing about about consciousness. Most of us now don't think that consciousness is what's controlling most of the system most of the time, right? Whatever consciousness is, it might even be a tip of the iceberg. So all mental states are bodily events and states. The reason I actually say bodily events or states is that I did some work back in the 90s with a colleague, Jillian Einstein, who's one of the, she's actually at Toronto, and she's the leading person, I would say, on sex in the brain. And we, we sort of talked about whole body explanations because it looks like for things like your sexual, the way you experience your own sexuality, possibly the way things uh, you think about certain things, are, are take up the whole body. They might involve the endocrine system and it might be for different purposes you would draw the scope of the mental event narrowly or widely. Okay, so I'm not gonna fuss over whether all mental events are only in the brain uh, I'm just going to say they're embodied. That'll be enough for physicalism to be okay. And then the question, so that's called token physicalism, to say each and every mental state is a physical state in an organism. There's something called type physicalism, which the philosophers in the room will know, which says something like this, and I believe in it, I mean, I would, most people I know who are in neuroscience run their labs assuming type physicalism for sensory and emotional experience. What do I mean by type physicalism? It would be, for all of us in this room who are not colorblind, if we held up a red tomato, we would all see it roughly. We'd have the same squiggle squaggle in the red detecting sector, something like that. It would be the same across members of the species. And you might say things like certain emotions, certain, some of the classic basic emotions, Ekman face <coughs> emotions, they might also be sort of widespread among members of the species. So when we all get scared of the snake, we move into the same physiological states. It would be more implausible for things like thinking that today is Tuesday, that that's realized in exactly the same way. All the physicalist says is it's realized in some way or other in you if you think today is Tuesday, okay? Now why think it? Well, it's just an inference to the best explanation. Given that we are animals, that's the Darwin part, plus you'd throw in some other powerful ideas having to do with causation and consistent relations among the sciences. So this is back to the Sellers idea. If you think that there's things like causation operates in the sort of normal ways we assume, then you've got to think that mental events are what's involved in the causal fray. So if I desire, uh, if I don't like Monet's, um, and I know that I don't like Monet's, that's subjectively realized in me, and I won't choose the Monet. I'll choose the Nora Jones over it. Uh, so this is, these are some of the reasons. Now, here's a picture of mine that I've, uh, I got this diagram, I don't know if this will work, from Viktor Frankl, who wrote a wonderful book called Man's Search for Meaning. First, he was a classically trained sort of Freudian analyst. Then he went to Auschwitz and Dachau, and when he got out, he kind of changed things up a little bit. And he wrote a lot of books, and I was doing an independent study with a nursing school student, of all things, and I came across this. And he actually used this picture to say something about the mind. And here's how it works. So picture that 16 ounce, imagine that that's like a 16 ounce cup, 
or can. You can imagine like a, a can. Here's the, his picture was that when, when I tell you what it's like for me to see a red tomato, that's activity inside the can. Okay? That's my nervous system. I'm attached to my nervous system in the right sort of way such that I have my own and only my own experiences. I never have your experiences. This is a good evolutionary design. You have your own experiences because you're connected to your nervous system in the right way. Now, from the top or the bottom, you might imagine people like um, uh, Paul or um, Dan or any neuroscientist in this room looking at my experience of the red tomato using any technology you want. They could use single cell recording, they could use fMR, they could use EEG, okay? And they say, look at whenever Owen looks at the red apple, there's that squiggle squoggle. Well, what they're doing there is they're having a third personal perspective on my experience. But my experience is only had or captured by me. From the outside of the can coming in on the, on the sides, and I think this is very useful if we think about different ways of knowing a person. The first person perspective has a certain cachet. I sometimes know about myself, not perfectly at all. Sometimes people can tell how my experiences are implemented by looking from above or below. And then there are the people that I'm in, this is what I call follow the pronouns, the use, the other people in my life. What Mar Mar Martin Buber talked about being in I-thou relationships with other people. These are people who come at me from the sides and envelop me, move around me, see me, are in relation to me, and they know me yet in a third way. They know me in yet a third way. My friends and my loved ones know me in these other ways. There's these three distinct epistemic perspectives. The metaphysics, that have no metaphysical consequences whatsoever. They just happen to be three distinct epistemic perspectives, the first person, the second person, and the third personal. Um, how am I doing on time for what I told you? I before I get to 45? Yeah. Good. Okay, so, so, so an idea here would be this. This is sometimes called the phenomenal concept strategy. So a, a good fellow physicalist named uh, David Papineau says this, material concepts are those which pick out conscious properties as items in the third personal causal wor world. That would be like if um, Paul's research group says, look at, there's the activation of the Nora Jones there's his Nora Jones activity, and there's his Jay-Z. I don't know, I don't know, you're a rap star. <laughs> uh, there's his Jay-Z activity, okay? And we can tell that he's gonna choose, and I'm gonna bring in Paris Hilton over here to distract him a little bit, and it's causing this problems. Um, uh, he, he's seeing the, the realizers of my, what I experience, I might not experience in this way, but I maybe would in that case, subjectively. So the material concepts, that squiggle squaggle or that mountain of activation, is picked out by material concepts. But I pick it out in terms of a preference for Nora Jones. That's in terms of what it's like for me. That's the level at which I know it or have access. It's no more surprising that I have access to my preferences in that way than it is that I can tell you how the state of my digestive system, but I can't tell you anything about that there are E. coli, let alone what number there are. I'm not in touch with that. I'm not in any epistemic touch with that. Um, and then he says, Papineau says this, you can think of this materially in terms of nerve messages, brain activity, bodily flinch flinches, facial grimaces, and so on. Or you can think of it in terms of what it, is, it would be like and how it would be feel if it happened to you. And that brings up things about thinking about if it were to happen to me, imagination that we talked about earlier. So here's the idea, according to the phenomenal concept strategy, and it's totally part of the physicalist picture of things. Sure, our concepts th that pick out what it's like to experience blue are not the same concepts as the realizer of blue, the concepts that say this is a blue realizer in the human brain. But they're not, or they're not because of, for no metaphysical reasons at all. They're just not because they're different access to them. Nonetheless, my experience of seeing blue or seeing red is a physical event in me. That's all the physicalist has to say. It just is a physical event in me. How, if you accept Darwin's theory of evolution, could you think it's anything else? Where is it happening? Okay? This is the basic picture. Now, so back in, this is, uh, this is from a paper I did, but it, this was also in my 91 book. So here's what I, I said all along. I said, look it, 
If you look at the, the way the best neuroscience is done, or the best psychology for that matter, of course, um, you'll see that people bring together these different perspectives. My method, or my commitment to physicalism, is in anything but, as it were, best practices already embedded in the system. So here's, so here's an idea. So what I have is phenomenology, psychology, and neuroscience. Think this way. This is an example I gave. Um, this is work I think Wolfgang uh, brought up, Logo, uh, Logothetes. Is that his name, Logothetes? Uh, so there's an experiment done by Logothetes and Schall in the 80s. It had to do, as I recall, with binocular rivalry in rhesus macaques. So what you do is you, you already have antecedent reason to think that there's an area of the brain, I think it might have been the superior sulcus, where there's detection of, so what you, you basically are moving horizontal and vertical lines, something like that, or you could do a Necker cube. It's one of these kind of, you've taught the, you've operantly conditioned the rhesus macaque to press a button when it sees the figure or ground switch in a, in a uh, Necker cube. Or this case, I think it was this. If you hold a, the head steady and you do this kind of thing, at some point or other, there'll be a visual lock on horizontal or vertical. So you have the monkey learn to tell you for a reward whether it saw horizontal or vertical. And what you're doing is you're mapping a population of neurons in the relevant area of the brain. So what you're doing is you're getting phenomenological reports of how it seems to the monkey. All of a sudden the monkey says, hmm, vertical, hmm, horizontal. And you watch its behavior and you see what the brain is doing. And what you find out is that you can write, I could call Paul up here, a different, in fact this is it. This, there's a differential equation. <laughs> you can write about the population of neurons and what they're doing. And then the physicalist says, and that's the realization of the seeing horizontal or vertical. Inference to the best explanation. What else could it be? Uh, actually, you could expand this, and this is a, um, depending on your problem, this is again just how good science operates. You bring together all the information sources, okay? The phenomenology, the neuroscience, the psychology, the evolutionary psychology, and so on, and you come up with a full story. Okay. So here's the upshot for today. Um, don't, uh, if you, I hope, I, I was worried about, this is the trouble with any therapy. If you expose people to a bad idea, they might become attracted to it. <laughs> uh, but the upshot for today is, if you weren't antecedently attracted to believing that there is an insurmountable hard problem, don't go there. Um, uh, the, the upshot really is this. Let the natural method proceed. Allow the sciences to mature. At the end of the day, when we come to understand the mind, we'll understand it as psychobiologically realized. Uh, uh, the story is already emerging. We heard uh, various people today using this kind of method. Um, and um, the really hard problem, so I wrote a book um, uh, making a pun on David Chalmers' book. I think that um, if we come to accept that the mind-body problem will be solved by scientists, uh, or is being solved by scientists, um, the mind scientists, the Geistes, Fist, and Schaft, and people, but without the Geist, then there is still a problem we face, and that's something that Paul has written uh, about what I call the really hard problem. The really hard problem is this. If you fully accept the message that you are an animal, 100% animal, living in a material world, then there's new stakes in the question of like, what's it all about? What's the purpose and the meaning of it all? Uh, but that's for another uh, day. Thank you very much. Oh, well, that was for Quebec <laughs> province, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, if there are any questions, I'll let you. Please. Uh, thanks very much. Um, I was interested on the subject of therapy. I noticed that uh, recently Gary Gunning wrote an article in the Stone in the New York Times on um, the <coughs> art problem with the idea and so on. And I saw many commenters, including friends of mine, who are, in fact, interested in things like theology and that sort of thing, uh, who you would expect to actually ended up saying, to my surprise, that it was a, a, either a circular argument or that, uh, that it was taking the question in some passive way. Now, I was wondering, would you level that claim uh, or that critique against things like the zombie argument um, and uh, Lewis's approach uh, of taking the question? Uh, would you go that far? Or? Uh, 
let, let me tell the audience what, uh, I mean, I, I wrote Gary Gutting the minute I saw that New York Times star opinionator, because I often send him fan mail for things that he does well. So one, what he's talking about is uh, one day about a month ago or so, he said, I'm really interested what, or, what people think about, and he gave the Mary the Colorblind Scientist thought experiment and Chalmers imagine a, du a duplicate of yourself without consciousness. And then he had uh, readers reply. Now, I couldn't even bear, I never can bear to read what the readers think in the New York Times. <laughs> uh, so you, I'm glad, uh, thank you for your heroism. Uh, but again, I, I mean, on that note about the therapy, my problem is just is that their philosophers are good verbally and we're good at thinking of clever trick thought experiments and we're, so I don't, there's so many different things that I think about the, this methodology that I probably shouldn't say uh, in, um, I think it's a serious problem. I think the problems of, uh, in what analytic metaphysics now are a very, very serious problem. I don't know if I'd say that they're, uh, I'd have to look specifically at particular arguments to see if they're question begging or not. But um, uh, I think there's, I just don't get, I think it's tennis without a net. Yeah. Please. Well, uh, that's fine with me to work on what understanding is, and I think what we find right away, there are different kinds of understanding. Um, I'm interested in this question of whether or not, you know, you might think when, when you set off um, AI to figure out the way nature ticks, when AI produces the information, is there now a place in the world in which it's understood, even if it's not in the minds of sentient beings yet? I'm inclined to think I'm okay with that, but it's a different kind of understanding than we're used to. All I want to say about there's classical philosophical work on the differences between understanding, explanation, prediction, and retrodiction. Some of it is excellent. There are plenty of philosophers of science in the room who could tell us about that. Um, there is a whole uh, view that came out of Germany uh, in the 1900s about Verstehen, which has been very influential in anthropology about being actually participant observer and understanding from the inside what it is like to be and I approve of that, and I think there are all these different methods. What I object to is that with the mind-body problem, it's commonly said that the explanation should satisfy us. And that's where I worry of uh, who the us is and why it should satisfy us. I mean, you could, I, I, sus I suspect a certain amount of narcissism in this case. It's that we don't like a certain story about ourselves being told, which is this materialistic story, which people do view as disenchanting. I'm not sure that the same problem wouldn't be, like how many people in this room have done the hydrolysis experiment that shows that water is H2O? Okay, like about eight people. So the rest of you believe that water is H2O? <laughs> yeah. And it do, I mean, do you understand? Is it satisfying to you? I don't know if it is or isn't. I think that if you paid attention to, if you just go into a, a room and look at the periodic table of elements and watch the way it expands and you find out gold is the substance with atomic number 79, you say, that's so satisfying to me. <laughs> I don't, I don't think people react that, so I'm with you, yeah. Please, yes. Thanks. Um, um, I'm really curious about something. So you talk about um, how consciousness is sort of a physical realizer for consciousness, not just what you physically explain. Um, I'm really curious, uh, for clarification, so if talking supposes that consciousness is something like there's a particular phenomenon, consciousness, it's a physical one, and we'll, we'll explain it. So I'm curious whether you think that means consciousness is something like a homogeneous phenomenon that we'll explain, or whether we might think of it something like consciousness might be, um, to take Sauer's example, rooted in the manifest image, not the scientific image, in which case it isn't that consciousness is sort of explained by the brain or consciousness is in some sense realized by the brain, it's just that the concept is rooted in this way of talking that is just sort of leading to this problem. You said several things that are uh, very important and helpful. So Sellers had behavioristic and uh, uh, eliminativist tendencies. So he thought, he did sometimes think, as you just pointed out, as did Quine. Quine and B.F. Skinner, Fred Skinner were members of the Society of Fellows at Harvard together. Behaviorism was, you know, reigning. 
And uh, so all these people were suspicious about consciousness. Uh, uh, all I wanted, but, so thank you for that. So there are different reactions that people could take. The answer to your question is this. Um, I don't think we should think of consciousness as a faculty. Certainly that's not going to work out. Um, we also should think of it, um, so your question was, is it homogeneous or heterogeneous? Clearly, phenomenologically, it comes in different types. I mean, there's like the consciousness when I'm uh, in non-REM sleep, logically perseverative, bland, non-visual. Non there's the kind that when I'm in REM sleep, highly visual. We know what's going on in the brain at those different times. Uh, there's, uh, emotional, there's my emotional feelings, which do feel like they involve my whole body. There's thoughts that today is Tuesday. When I wrote my book on consciousness, there was, uh, at the time, a lot of people were looking for a marker like 40 hertz activity. That was the, that was the big thing um, then. And that was in fashion then, and then it went out of fashion for a while, and now it's coming back in. So the idea could be, it might be the case that every conscious mental state has something going on in it such that it is conscious. But that's, again, not something which, as it were, I'm, I'm not entitled to an opinion about that. That's part of the lesson of today. Although, I'm entitled to tell you about the phenomenology, and the phenomenology I can tell you from my point of view and what I hear other people say, it seems like. Different things seem like. Please. Speak up a little bit. Okay, so I think what we could say, usually when I work on consciousness, I usually say something like this. Uh, again, it has to do with the way people, so I said the, f the, the first problem to solve is something like this. What is it like to be a creature who can have the, the, the lowest level consciousness experiences? Like maybe, you, you could imagine telling, this would be a just so story, say something like, the first creatures that were sentient, well, we know that like visual system evolved, some people think, 75 different times on Earth, I think. Okay, along different, it wasn't just, you know. So, set, so being, having photoreceptor cells in a light, very well lit environment looks like a really terrific adaptation. So imagine that that was the modality. I don't think that those creatures, the first ones who had sight, were aware that they had sight. They weren't meta-aware or they weren't self-reflective. We are enormously self-reflective, and we can be aware of our awarenesses, and we know from all the Woody Allen movies, it can go meta, meta, meta until you're like, <laughs> you're lost. Um, so we have clearly all those capacities, and it's a very interesting question how they are all realized, to what degree they're completely, some of them are completely socially constructed, it looks like, although they have to be on a scaffolding that makes it, it has to be possible for me to do these kind of things. So these are like really the rocket science questions about how the system works, I think, uh, eventually. But I think we start with low things like, you know, pleasure and pain reception look to be very, very adaptive. So, and they're, you know, um, we know that, yeah, you get the idea. Yeah, please. Yeah. Answer. yeah. What is the problem with that, that the monkey actually raised the question but cannot answer? Well, I, you're right. I mean, of course, and, and we heard this from Wolfgang. That, I mean, there are, uh, you know, uh, unsolvable problems, you know, in, inside uh, in mathematics. Uh, and um, I guess the reason, first of all, this, isn't, this doesn't seem to me like to be a formal problem inside a particular mathematical system. It seems like a question, what we're asking is, what is the best way to think about conscious mental events in a world that we know has these other properties? It's, we think, we could give up Darwinism, but if we accept Darwinism, we could say, we are animals, and we're 100% animals. And then you could say to yourself, huh, 
So on these views of we're 100% animal, do animals have any non-physical parts? That's usually what a property dualist or a substance dualist thinks. There's a non-physical part. And the answer to that seems to be, no, animals don't have non-physical parts. Consciousness comes with a living human body. It goes away when you're dead. And how exactly it's realized for all the different types of consciousness is an empirical question. But every, we should bet that it's realized in this system. Otherwise, and here's another problem, you pay the price of epiphenomenalism because if you don't think it's realized in this system, then it's hard to explain, it, well then you have to give up the idea that it does any causal work. It's, it is an illusion. And I don't think we should go that route, which was, as you mentioned, something that Sellers himself was tempted by. It just seems like it's the end of the world as we know it. But does that make sense? In other words, I would just distinguish, like inside a deductive system, Okay, there are these uh, incomplete, I mean, uh, unsolvable problems, unsolvability of halting problems, and so on and so forth, girdling completeness results. Uh, sometimes we see them in things like Heisenberg. Some people will say, well, a Heisenberg uncertainty principle is a physical one of these, where it says you can't predict the position and the momentum of an electron at the same time. Someone says, well, maybe that's it. It's kind of a reflexivity problem. I can't see, back to Eddington, my love of my children and my wife at the same time as my love for my children and my wife and as oxytocin surges, something like that. That's an interesting psychological predicament and I take it seriously. You know, because we, we joke sometimes, we philosophers, we say, you know, suppose that like the oxytocin story becomes, you know, prominent, like we used to tease the churchlands about these things, you know. And then they, you know, so you meet your beloved in college someday in 10 years and you look into her eyes and instead of saying, I've just never felt this way before, I love you so much, you say something like, I'm getting oxytocin surges in, se <laughs> in sector 1704. I mean, it's just, <clears throat> so it's not clear that we can easily speak in these two ways, but it has to do with the access conditions are different. You want to go again? Yeah. I, I, uh, let me go, yes, please. Gazaniga. This is a question related to something Paul showed, the various levels of explanation in his slide. I mean, I want to be agnostic right now, I mean, about what level is the best. I mean, I really admire, for example, in this room, standing up right now, okay, we have someone who works at sort of level of computational explanation. Got Paul Thagard right in front of me, who works at, or, you know, a lot of his work has been at the level of sort of cognitive psychological level. Then you have people working at the neural level. How those all map onto each other is complicated. The question about conscious experience is usually asked is something like this. In a living organism as understood by the, the mind sciences and the biological sciences, where if anywhere is the consciousness realized? And I say, in here. Okay? Now if someone says, tell me how it came out of the bosons and the fermions, I say, you have to talk to other people about that. I'm going home. You know that? <laughs> Be, but I think it's an interesting and important question. This is about the reductionism issues that are, um, uh, but that's above my pay grade. Yeah. Uh, here, and then I'll go back to you one. Yeah. So when you were talking about how lay people might never find the explanation satisfying, it's an actually two part question. But yeah. Do, do, you, do, the do you expect the experts will find it satisfying? Um, I think the experts, it's a good question. I mean, I don't know, then I'm just making a guess, right? I mean, I'm doing something like uh, a Dan Gilbert or a Dan Schachter sort of projection into the future about how the community will. I think very often in the history of science, certain questions seem less perplexing over time once we, it's like the water is H2O thing. You could just imagine, I mean, someone said, it's amazing, water is H2O. You say, really? It looks like a homogeneous, Looks like it doesn't have any parts. You say, well, it does. You say, I, I'm having trouble. So you could imagine, and then it becomes part. I think Niels Bohr said, yesterday science is today's common sense. So I guess I just would think that the sociology of knowledge would take care of it. 
a little bit more. Because here's the second part, but actually, if, you're, if what you said is right, then this second part does not arise, which maybe, maybe is a mistake here. I wonder if your position is so different in some ways than the Mysterian position. And, and the reason is because if a Mysterian is looking for a feeling of understanding, if that's when they think that they're done explaining, then they probably, ex you know, then, then when, you're, when you're done, they feel that they need more because you're never getting that satisfying feeling. And so you, you both have the same knowledge, you kind of agree what it says, and they're like, I feel like there should be something more, and you say, you know, but that's not what you're going to get. The, the, the kind of, mis thank you, but uh, the kind of Mysterian I'm worried about is someone who does, like Chalmers, think that the most plausible position is a kind of immaterialism. So that's not a position I'm willing to take. They actually think that the kind of naturalistic position that I'm endorsing is not the plausible one. Yeah? Um, I'm just wondering, like, do you know if there's any current sort of research or field where you combine, um, I, I guess, consciousness and what I mentioned before, like being aware of like social skills kind of things, and also combining with um, the first lecture of today, which was the uh, projection into the future? Yeah. Well, I was going to say, I mean, I think that the labs of everybody in this room would be, I mean, what I said really, I meant it, when I wrote about the natural method of triangulating and bringing in all the explanatory resources, I think that's the dominant method that we see in neurosciences, and there's a whole bunch of other people here are better than I am. Social neuroscience, which is interested in these questions about how social scripts enter into uh, cognition. I mean, and I really do think, I didn't, it's not part of my talk today, but uh, because of work that I've done in non-Western philosophical traditions, uh, uh, where I've had to pay attention to what people think on the ground, as I said, I think a big social cause uh, of believing in ver certain kinds of dualism or being attracted to them have to do with uh, larger Weltanschauungs, to speak Germanly, that people have ways of viewing the world, and these things are all part of a piece. I'll have to talk to you afterwards. You're, you're too uh, enthusiastic. You can. <laughs> sure. Um, so I was wondering, you mentioned that do you like buy Paul Bloom's research that dualism is innate or just? I think, I have a good. I don't actually buy Paul Bloom's story. I like, I had up the second bullet there was something more from Alison Gopnik's work, which I do buy, which is that uh, if creatures have um, eyes, or if you know cartoons have eyes, we give different kinds of explanations for them than if they're just blocks without eyes. So humans give purposeful explanations for things that look animate and non-purposeful ones that th don't. I think that's okay. Paul is sometimes towards innate substance dualism, but but I, but I, yes, I think that's part of it. So go ahead. So then I was wondering when you talk about different types of explanations, some being um, unsatisfactory to just say the lay person, and some. Then, as some explanations being intuitively appealing, what is that intuition that those lay explanations are appealing to? Then, if there isn't some sort of innate um, conception of dualism. Good. So that what was well. It could be two different things. That's why I put different. I have different diagnostics. One, I think, and, and, and a good a good philosopher who also does experimental philosophy named Sean Nichols, at the University of Arizona, he's been pushing this line that it has to do with this different styles of explanation for intentional agents, animals basically, and for objects is why we have trouble feeling that it's satisfactory. I think that's probably part of the story and I also, as I said, think it has to do with Weltanschauung things. If you're, if you're brought up in, look at, most North Americans, you Canadians are more heathens, but most, <laughs> most North Americans on surveys are members of some Abrahamic tradition or other. Now, that tra those traditions come with the idea that you survive. When I go to Thailand, where I've interviewed Buddhists uh, for five weeks, I interviewed well-educated Buddhists, and I say, why do you give monks merit? And they say, I give monks merit uh, so that I get a better rebirth. I said, do you really believe in rebirth? They say, yes. Now, if you believe in rebirth, there's some part of you that's going on. It fits much better with some kind or other of non-physicalism. So, your argument is then predicated upon like, like social experience. No, that's true. why I said it's different. Yeah, so on the slide that you first referred to about yeah. Paul Bloom, I have different, there's different things. So one's a cognitive bias, possibly. Yeah. One's a social one. Yeah. And then there's others. Yeah. Uh, the gentleman back there first. Yeah. <laughs> Speak up a little bit. 
Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure what you want me to, I mean, it's a rhetorical device. I mean, Chalmers calls it the hard problem. Before him, Joe Levine called it an explanatory gap. I, you know, it's a little bit of fun trash talking a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but some people do think it's a mystery because of the, uh, as I say, Colin McGinn in a paper that he published in a top philosophy journal. This is sort of embarrassing <laughs> because this is not in, you know, Neuron or Psych Review. His paper was called, ha why we can't solve the mind-body problem. And it was about the chimpanzees asking questions about quantum physics type of argument. It was that there's cognitive, what he called cognitive closure of the problem. So uh, there are some people who deserve the name of Mysterians. Yeah. Please. No, no, I'm suggesting something like this, that if someone asks you the question, what are people nowadays thinking about the mind-body problem, <laughs> you should say, people are thinking that conscious mental states are realized in organisms that have conscious mental states. If someone asks you, where do, what creatures, how low down do they go, then you say, well, there's controversies about whether scallops, oysters, and clams are conscious. Most people think not. Fish probably are, and then you've got to get to the experts. But no, I think it's, it's an assumption that you make, but, but it, you make it based on an inference to the best explanation. So it isn't just an assumption out of thin air. You don't say, well, for purposes of this argument, let's assume this. No, you say, if I'm asked the question, the convergence of all the things we know from the sciences and how the causal world operates makes it an inference to the best explanation. It's abductive or inductive. It's not deductive. But there's no other contender out there. That's, Oh, no, you're allowed to do that. I would not be able to get paid for teaching undergraduates if it wasn't for uh, being able to ask that question. Yeah, no. Yeah, I mean, it's a free world and all that, so, yeah. Uh, woman over there, sorry. You're asking me <laughs> to help you think of yourself as a zombie. I'm just asking how could that present cold water? I'm with you. So <laughs> when, peop when, when, when people do these thought experiments, what Chalmers has had to do is when he realized that you know, most people wouldn't get on board with it, he said, well, it's ideally conceivable. Well, that means that if you sit around with other people playing Australian rules philosophy and you get in the right mood, you will start to see it. But I can't help you. <laughs>